My name is Henry Corian. I am the Chief Product Officer of Imatest, and this is the Imatest 23.2 webinar. I'm also joined by JP Weston Scow, our Test Lab Services Manager. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, Imatest background of the company, uh, resolution, uh, stray light, uh, some of our test equipment, uh, test charts, and some changes in our um, software that we've done in the last year, and also uh, the test lab services we're now offering. So uh, as a uh, overview of the company, uh, we are headquartered in uh, Boulder, Colorado. Uh, we have uh, partners and resellers around the world, uh, about 4,000 uh, users of our software and 30 employees. Uh, we have uh, software, equipment, and test charts, including uh, a user interface version, interf Imitest Master, our automation version, Imitest IT, and then Imitest Ultimate, which is uh, a license that includes um, the, both the, the GUI and the, the API. Uh, we have a range of equipment, uh, depending on your test distance, the field of view. Uh, you may uh, use a different type of equipment to kind of try to reproduce the uh, uh, similar arrangement to where you're using your camera. Uh, and then a range of uh, test charts, uh, depending on the image quality factor you're interested in uh, evaluating. And those can uh, be available on a, a range of different substrates from very high precision small targets to lower precision large targets. Uh, so the workflow for using Imatest is to um, load your file in, or you can use our automated image acquisition from a large number of cameras directly connected to your computer. Uh, once you've acquired the image, we'll detect the uh, target on there that image and um, select the analysis you're going to run. And then we'll generate a set of data outputs and reports from that. Uh, so I'm going to talk about resolution. Uh, one of the most popular image quality factors. And um, the ISO standard uh, for resolution is called ISO 12233. And this uses a range of different types of features uh, to measure uh, sharpness, including slanted edges, uh, hyperbolic wedges, and uh, sinusoidal Siemens stars. So depending on the type of processing, uh, different patterns may be more or less accurate. Um, and especially I'll get it, I'll get into that right now. So the, the slanted edge is kind of our um, most commonly used resolution measurement uh, feature. This was introduced in uh, the 2000 ISO 12233 standard and has recently been revised to have more angles of uh, edges available so that you can test uh, you know, sagittal and tangential MTF in the corners of your image. So uh, the uh, in order to use slanted edges, you know, if you care about the underlying uh, optical mechanics of your system, uh, you want to have uh, your sharpening uh, turned off. Otherwise, the the metrics uh, produced from the slanted edge can be kind of exaggerated. Uh, so I, ideally, you'll you'll test uh, using a, a raw image, uh, you know, if you're more concerned about the um, the end processed image, then you know, we will you can measure you know what the perceived image quality is, uh, but uh, sometimes you know if that if the processing is extreme, then some of the metrics can can get pushed to, uh, very very high and and may not be as repeatable as as you would want them to be. So the big advantage for the the slanted edge is a spatial precision. You can measure from you know as small as like about you know 16 pixels squared. Ideally, you'll have a little bit more space for your your slanted edge, uh, but you can get this really detailed map of sharpness across your uh, image, and the calculations are very fast. And uh, we've recently added uh, information metrics which combine sharpness and noise, uh, which I'll talk about a bit later. Um, the disadvantage is that uh, for each edge, you're only looking at one angle of MTF. Uh, so, you know, that might be, you know, sagittal to the, the the field. It might be tangential or some sort of combination of sagittal and tangential. Uh, so really, if you want to look at uh, your 
uh, best and worst performance, you should look at both sagittal and tangential edges. And that's why this standard has been recently revised um, last year. And so um, the other disadvantage is that, that large impact of sharpening. And so, um, and it depends on which metric you're using. Some metrics like MTF50P are less affected by sharpening, uh, where others like MTF50 are, you know, or MTF10 especially are um, very highly affected by sharpening. And, you know, you may get um, spatial frequency responses that look a little little strange if, if you know, that sharpening is at extreme. Uh, so uh, the hyperbolic wedge is uh, uh, part of the ISO 12233-2014 standard. Um, this uh, is kind of similar to the TV lines measurement, uh, which uh, is in line widths per picture height, uh, kind of measuring how how many of these bars can can we see um, across the the vertical height of the image. So um, this uh, advantage of this is it's less impacted by signal processing than the slanted edge, uh, and it has a um, we've improved the kind of frequency distribution in the latest version of this wedge using a logarithmic uh, frequency distribution instead of a hyperbolic frequency. And so um, that is something where um, we've released with our latest version of this chart. Um, a disadvantage, uh, another disadvantage is that it is only one angle like the slanted edge. Um, the, the kind of large target size um, means kind of low spatial precision. So, you know, one end of the wedge may start in one portion of your field and end in another. And so it's it's kind of a rough measure of, of where where that uh, MTF loss is happening. Uh, it is often used for subjective analysis, which uh, can be problematic uh, compared to objective analysis. And uh, uh, low uh, sometimes there can be some precision problems if you have a very sharp system where the bars are um, in phase with your pixels or or out of phase with your pixels. You know, you could have a if it's if it's in phase with your pixels, the bars might be very um, uh, high. Re you know, they they may have be very high contrast. But if you go out of phase with your pixel array, then basically it averages between those bars, and they can completely disappear. Uh, so um, some some weird things can happen. That that's really only at at fractions of the Nyquist frequency, and if you have a sharp lens, that that's that's really a problem. Uh, the sinusoidal Siemens star uh, is uh, was introduced in 2014, and um, advantage here is that it it supports many different angles of MTF, uh, and it's also less impacted than signal processing than the slanted edge. Disadvantage: uh, the the target's even larger than the the wedge, so low low spatial detail, and also a low calculation speed because there's so many pixels for the target. Um, the sinusoidal mod modulation is also um, hard to produce in unitone chart technologies like chrome on glass, uh, which could be a problem at, you know, very um, uh, close close range uh, or ma macro testing uh, where you need a high precision target. Uh, so there is a, um, a texture, um, there's a texture blur metric, I, uh, which is based off of the IEEE 1858. Uh, so this is a kind of a resolution measurement uh, where you're trying to see how these uh, um, sort of low contrast, high frequency texture in your image is preserved. And so this is a this is especially important for images of foliage or biological images or you know you know skin skin has texture to it. Um, you want to preserve that texture. And uh, there's a recent revision to the uh, camera phone image quality IEEE 1858 standard, which better separates the noise analysis uh, from the sharp from the um, texture blur analysis by uh, performing a signal averaging. So you take a, a large number of of exposures of this texture target, which we call the spilled coins target, and you average them together, and it kind of removes the noise from that averaging process. Uh, you could, um, in the past, there's been issues with this where, you know, at low light, the noise can kind of masquerade as texture. And so this new method allows for the um, you to really measure the texture 
uh, blur. And uh, that's, you know, the, the challenge in, in designing uh, signal processing is um, to tune it such that, you know, you're removing the noise, but you're not removing the texture. And, you know, it's hard to distinguish those. So it's, it's, it's a tricky thing. This is probably something that you, you would really only want to use on, on processed images, um, which have gone through that, that denoising. Otherwise there's, there's not a, um, not a real, uh, this is not necessary for, for raw images. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about stray light, which uh, I think is a more, um, a less commonly tested uh, image quality factor. Uh, compared to resolution, which is probably the most commonly tested. Uh, we um, Here are some examples of stray light. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, different types of stray light. Uh, there's, uh, you know, these beams, these kind of weird radial things. There's ghost images that look like, you know, a little copies of your aperture. There are... Um, uh, uh, Kind of yeah, lots of different uh, sort of artifacts that can be um, caused by um, you know it's essentially a, a, a form of uh, optical noise, uh, and this is something that uh, actually may be appealing in some cases. Uh, uh, you may uh, know about a, a filmmaker called Michael Bay, who's very popular uh, um, action filmmaker, uh, who's um, patented sort of uh, uh, stray light is, is is part of what makes, you know, their their scenes exciting. And so uh, this is, this is uh, something that actually may may help pictorial image quality. Uh, but it, when, it, when it comes to doing machine vision, it can cause uh, problems like here we have um, a um, we have contrast loss, uh, or veiling glare. Uh, which you know can kind of wash out some of the details in the dark of the image. Um, you can get false color. You can get false features and ghost or ghost images. Um, and you know the big thing is that it, it's really something that limits dynamic range. And so you know we have a lot of um, you know we do have a lot of people testing dynamic range a lot more than stray light. And we a lot of our users find that you know they have a very high dynamic range sensor. But when it comes to you know putting a lens on that sensor and taking a a, a scene from the real world, uh, and with with light coming in from all angles, that's that's where the stray light uh, really starts to limit the dynamic range. So uh, you know while people are trying to get 120 or more decibels of dynamic range, it's it's very very difficult for that to be achievable in uh, without um, you know really well designed optics optical coatings and um, you know, coatings on the inside of the camera module that are anti-reflective and, you know, basically trying to avoid any sort of internal reflections um, that are um, outside of the designed uh, optics. And, uh, you know, the higher, higher dynamic range sensors are definitely more susceptible to stray light. Uh, so there's kind of an old approach for measuring uh, stray light, which is to capture images of a chart um, that has uh, black or very dark patches on that. Those could be light traps or they could be, uh, you know, opaque uh, patches on a light box. Uh, and then you 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 analyze those patches to see how how not dark they are. And um, this is more of a, a measure of veiling glare. It's it's kind of like a sort of like a worst case scenario to have light absolutely coming in from every angle. But I don't think it's really that representative of a natural scene, and um, you know, there's limited analysis points where you're really actually sampling. So, um, and it doesn't always, you know, doesn't consider uh, sources outside of the camera's field of view, and it is, um, you know, difficult to use for wide field of view cameras, and does not reveal all kinds of stray light. So this is what has led us to. Uh, pioneer sort of new new methods of stray light evaluation. Uh, so the, the new way we're doing it is to have a, a small bright light, uh, a light source that is um, captured in a dark room. And uh, you can either uh, rotate, you can keep the camera fixed and rotate the light source, or um, the approach we do is we'll keep the light source fixed and rotate the camera. Uh, the azimuth and rotation to 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 build a field coverage, 
inside and outside of the field of view. And uh, then we analyze the image data and normalize it to represent a metric. And this is uh, going to be standardized in the ISO 18844 Part 2, uh, as well as the IEEE P2020 automotive standards. And there's some other standardization efforts that are similar to this approach. Uh, so the hardware that would be involved in this sort of test setup is a um, uh, LED light source. Uh, the, ideally, um, you can use a, a diffuse source, but ideally a collimated source is the, the best uh, solution. Um, a, a motorized gimbal to uh, achieve the tilt and rotation of the device. Uh, and then um, we put the gimbal and the light source onto uh, this new fixture, which we call the benchtop test stand. And um, and then you also want to, you know, block out any light um, surrounding that using this kind of curtain fixture. Uh, so uh, some more about our light source. Um, this is a visible only uh, light source that we've released last year, and it produces a small bright light source as a collimated beam. And uh, when you look at this source, it's kind of a, has an angular size similar to the suit. Similar to the sun, about a, a half degree uh, angular uh, size, and uh, it we designed it to have minimized internal reflection, so no halo uh, around around the uh, uh, light source, which some of our competitors' light sources have those halos. Uh, so uh, this is an example of what that beam looks like, you know, kind of projected on a gray card. And, um, you know, it's about a 25 millimeter diameter beam. And um, so if your lens is larger than that, it might not be the right source. And actually we're working on a, a new source that has improved spatial uniformity and also um, infrared options. Uh, and that'll be coming out uh, probably this first quarter. Uh, so the gimbal is, uh, you know, this can be used for many different things besides stray light. You could use it for, um, you know, doing uh, testing the target projection, uh, you know, um, testing the corner of your image with a, a long range target projector. Uh, and this can be set up for uh, pitch and yaw or roll and yaw. Um, for And the roll and yaw configuration is what we recommend for the stray light testing. Uh, so yeah, the the trick is to get the the entrance pupil of your camera um, to not move outside of the beam as you rotate this thing. So you might um, getting a, a a device holder um, such that the kind of center point of the gimbal and your um, entrance pupil position are aligned with each other is really the trick here. Uh, so um, this also has a goniometer for leveling, and uh, it goes on that um, bench top test stand, as well as our motorized test stand. Um, this is the azimuth and field angle. Uh, and uh, you. Uh, this is an example of an image with a, uh, a field angle, an azimuth angle of 30 degrees and a field angle of 20 degrees. Uh, so uh, you, if any of the light is getting into your device, you know, you might want to test it, even if your field of view is much narrower. Um, you know, you might want to have see what happens with light sources up to uh, 180 degrees, uh, yeah, especially if you're doing a, a safety uh, dependent thing like an automotive application. Um, you know, it's the failure modes where you know you've got a kind of a pedestrian with dark clothing, and you know your sun is on the horizon and kind of dazzling your camera. That's kind of what we're concerned about, and um, hopefully we can uh, motivate uh, folks to make. Uh, maybe a little bit more expensive cameras, better cameras that are safer um, than the ones that are being made right now, which have uh, poor stray light performance. Um, so this is uh, some some example test data um, where we've actually masked out the source um, because the source is not stray light; it's it's light, and and so that's why you you can see the source is masked out with black, and then everything else besides that is stray light. And, you know, this is moving at uh, kind of one degree increments. And you can see at, you know, at some positions, there's things kind of will light up. 
uh, like right right there, there's some some extra light. And so uh, unless you get this detailed map, you know, there may be some angles that uh, of light that that cause um, additional stray light. And that's that's why kind of moving through these small increments is is valuable. Uh, this is an example of an ultra wide field of view, 185 degree uh, camera. I think this is quite a beautiful thing. And you can see all these strange phenomena that are happening uh, in the extreme outer part of the field. Uh, so this is uh, again, increments of one degree. Um, in this in this case, we don't have a mask applied to it. Uh, so uh, this is quite a beautiful image to me. Um, so you can test uh, across a range of light level or exposures to uh, allow for measuring different magnitudes of stray light. Uh, in this case, we've got you can see that you know the longer the exposure, the more stray light we're collecting, and you can really start to see those um, kind of the petal petal flare. Uh, on the uh, the longer exposures. Uh, so, um, you know, the longer exposure is kind of similar to having a, a, a brighter light source. So that's one of the ways you can kind of, um, while, the, while the light source is nowhere near as bright as the sun, you can have a, a longer exposure to kind of um, replicate the same number of photons you would get from a short exposure of the sun. Uh, so that's stray light. I'm going to go move on to talking about some equipment. Uh, this is our Imatest modular test stand, which is our camera target and light source holder. And uh, it, it has a rail system. Uh, you can uh, have a, a, a test chart here. You can have a light box. Uh, there's a cable uh, camera mount. Um, and there is a version of this that is motorized. And um, you can add, so you can add motorization to the different axes. You could just add it to the Z axis if you want, or you could add other stages and then you could put the motorized gimbal on there. And um, then there's all kinds of different lighting that we can support with this. There's, uh, I'll, I'll get to that in, in the next slide here. And, and there's also a, a wide field of view version of it that has, um, allows you to position these targets in the corners of the field of view, testing up to 200 degree field of view. Uh, and it kind of gives you this polar coordinate system for placing these reflective targets in, in the corners of your wide field of view camera. And um, we use these SFR reg targets for kind of measuring resolution in the corners. And so uh, it does, and then this uses reflective lighting as well uh, because it's hard to get, um, hard to use this with light boxes. Uh, so there's a whole ecosystem around our modular test stand, um, you know, starting from the base, which is just the chart and camera holder, um, to adding on the lights, the wide field of view, um, light boxes, um, visible and infrared LEDs. There's a, there's a low light filter we have that goes over the visible LED to uh, kind of, because there's only so far you can dim down those LED. So if you want to test, you know, one lux or lower, then you can put this low light filter on there and it kind of masks out uh, with a neutral density and a slit um, to, to really cut down that light level. Uh, and then um, there's a motion blur module, which can, uh, you know, have a moving target up on there, target projector and light measurement uh, options that can be adapted to this. So it's quite quite a lot of possibilities um, for your imaging lab uh, with the MTS. So this is for kind of, you know, uh, short to medium distance testing. Uh, so if your camera has a, a, a long focal length, um, your minimum focus distance may be several meters. And this is typical for these automotive cameras. Uh, and so in that case, it may not be suitable to have a, um, kind of a target in free space um, because, you know, it might have to be an incredibly large target to fill your field of view or um, you, yeah, you may need a very large facility to, to test that properly, especially across, you know, the long range of working distances that are expected for automotive. Uh, so um, 
also for remote sensing, you know, and drones, you know, you may want to test them at long range, which is, you know, where you're using them. So um, the collimator lenses create a virtual image to simulate working distances up to infinity. Um, these can cover between just the, just the lenses themselves can cover be between five to 120 degrees field of view. Uh, the entrance pupil diameter is limited depending on the collimator lens selection. Uh, so uh, this is often, you'll find these collimator lenses in manufacturing uh, where they have a very limited amount of space in their factory. And they, you know, they want to test, you know, two to four meters distance a compact camera module, well, they don't have that much space in their factory. So they set up one of these collimator uh, systems. Uh, we have several different options for uh, collimators. Uh, the Imitest collimator fixture has um, these, these large collimator lenses. So we vary the distance between the collimator lens and the test chart using a, a motor system and can kind of dial in exactly which distance you want you know, all the way up into infinity. Um, so the um, we also have the benchtop test stand. Now this is uses a target projector. A benchtop test stand and the, the modular test stand can be adapted with a target projector, which is kind of a, you know, it's, it's, you know, a few degrees of your field of view um, that it projects a target. So it's, you know, it's a much smaller field of view than the lens system. Uh, but you can also kind of move this anywhere um, into the corners of your camera, even if it's beyond 120 degrees and test long range um, using that kind of projector, along with the gimbal uh, that that makes it practical uh, to, to set that up. Uh, so this is the this uh, linear motion blur module I had mentioned before. Um, this is uh, can move up to three meters a second and uh, test, you know, motion blur, ro rolling shutter, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, and there's a new standard for motion blur testing as part of the 1858, the camera phone image quality standard has a motion blur test specified. And so um, this is a hardware to support that test. Uh, so the benchtop test stand or BTS uh, I mentioned previously, it kind of originally uh, started as a endoscope test system. So we set up a magnetic chart mounting system uh, that uh, attaches, uh, you know, your, your chart can go right on that board and you can adjust it there or have multiple charts. Um, there's also, um, you know, an endoscope holder as included as part of it. And um, then there's also, um, I mean, the base is to have it manual. There's a motorized version of it as well uh, to um, the, the Z stage for, you know, doing depth of field tests. And the X stage is usually for, for switching targets. Uh, so, and then there's another version of the BTS, which is a stray light and target projector version. And so uh, I think we've talked about both of those and this is just, you know, they're, they they both use the gimbal. They just use different light sources and you can switch them uh, relatively quickly if you want to test resolution or stray light. I'm going to go over just a few of our charts uh, that I haven't talked about yet. Uh, there's these high dynamic range test charts and uh, they come in a variety of dynamic ranges. Uh, they're meant to uh, measure the kind of real world performance dynamic range of your system where light is coming at all different angles. You know, there's other dynamic range tests you can do where, you know, maybe you have a light source that you're testing at, at you know, you're changing the light level and testing a bunch of different images to see, you know, where do I not see any light? You know, where do I hit saturation? And um, that's kind of a more of a sensor test um, because it's, you know, a flat image has zero dB of dynamic range. And so that's not really, um, it's not really appropriate for an imaging system where um, the stray light is a limiting factor. So um, if you want to see what your, your imaging system can do, you know, you want to, you want to challenge it by having some, some sources of stray light. And so these kind of, we call the the gray world targets where they have this gray background. 
it's meant to kind of appease the auto exposure, which, uh, you know, if it's a black background, um, the exposure can have some issues uh, with, um, you know, saturation. So we do have this kind of mask that goes over the, the target, which is called the dark world mask. That mask um, can kind of replicate sort of more of a night scene. So if you have the you have the gray world target, which is kind of like a day scene, you have the, the dark world mask over it, which is kind of like a night scene. You can compare the dynamic range between those two and get an idea of how much dynamic your range you're losing from the additional, um, you know, sort of light outside of the patches uh, uh, that, um, you know, almost always has a, a impact. And, um, you know, one, one of the issues with this is that sometimes there can be ghost images, which are kind of, you know, radially opposite of the the field of view. So if your light source is here, you may see the ghost image is up here. And so sometimes, you know, the brightest patch is radially opposite from the darkest patch. So if you have a ghost image in that darkest patch, you know, say goodbye to your dynamic range. Um, so um, that's why it's valuable to measure stray light independently, uh, because um, this is kind of just a proxy for, for stray light measurement. Uh, we have another target called the contrast resolution. This is a dynamic range measurement. This has um, these kind of uh, sub areas with small density differences, two to one contrast uh, in these other uh, kind of regions that have light to dark of about uh, 95 dB uh, range of, of density. So um, this is meant to determine the useful dynamic range of a system uh, with uh, uh, these new uh, key performance indicators. There's a contrast resolution, and then there's a IEEE P2020 contrast performance index, which is uh, formerly known as contrast detection probability. And uh, this is, um, whereas the, the old dynamic, you know, the older style of dynamic range test chart, this can be heavily impacted by tone mapping. So, um, you know, if you have a highly processed, you know, maybe it's a combination of multiple exposures. The older style of targets don't necessarily work as well. Um, you may, um, because, you know, there, there'll be, the, the noise may go up and down. And, you know, so this this new contrast resolution target is, is meant to kind of test that real world performance. You know, can you see that low contrast object in the bright, in the dark? And, um, you know, that that's something that's going to be useful for kind of black box camera testing uh, where you can't you can't get the raw image. And um, so this, um, you know, it's still affected by stray light, uh, but uh, this is another um, alternative if you have a if you can't get that raw image. Uh, SFR reg is uh, just a handy sort of target you can place anywhere you want to measure. You saw that in our um, wide field of view fixture um, and the collimator target projectors use this. And so, I mean, it's, you know, it's a set of slanted edges and uh, you know, it's, you know, you can kind of, you could print out one of these and put it at a really long range and you could do long range testing with that as well. Um, if um, you don't, you don't actually need a collimator, uh, but um, it's, it's nice if you want to control things. Uh, so now I'm going to go over some features in our latest release, uh, 23.1 and 23.2. So everything in the last year. Uh, so uh, image information metrics, uh, we've also called this just information capacity. Um, these are these metrics that combine sharpness and noise uh, in a metric that's kind of intended for sort of machine vision performance. So there's a variety of uh, types of metrics that are related to that. There's a um, ideal observer signal noise ratio. There's noise power spectrum and noise equivalent quanta. So uh, these are kind of uh, these metrics have been around for quite a while, but they haven't been commonly used outside of the medical industry. Uh, and we've adapted this new method for measuring it from the slanted edge. Um, this is going to be standardized in an ISO standard, 
And also uh, uh, Norman Corrin, our founder, who is, is going to be giving a keynote about this at the Electronic Imaging Conference uh, later this month in January of 2024. And uh, that's um, an exciting uh, kind of a new field because, uh, you know, sharpness alone doesn't uh, necessarily, I mean, it's necessary uh, to do machine vision, but it's not 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 sufficient. So, you know, you have to look at these other metrics and um, if you want to get things that are going to correlate the best with uh, uh, machine vision performance. And that's something we're still studying. And, um, you know, it's a kind of an active area of research. We're interested in, you know, collaborating with some um, other institutions on this uh, research. And if you're interested in it, please check out this, this web page. Um, we also have improved the detection of those SFR reg targets using a uh, AI detection model, which is especially good for low light identification of those targets. Uh, we've added this uh, uh, EMBA 12V88, which is the European Machine Vision Association, uh, row column and pixel noise uh, into our flat field analysis. Um, that adds to some other EMVA measurements we've already had. Uh, we added this um, color gamut viewer called Gamut Vision, which is something we released a long time ago as a standalone thing, but we've just rolled that into Imatest Master. And um, going on to the 23.2 release, which happened uh, last October, uh, the uh, new uh, we've added this new ISO 12233 2022 standard test target which has uh, goes from the slanted squares to the slanted stars to kind of double the number of uh, slanted edge regions that are available for measurement. Uh, there's also um, a fifth order poly polynomial curve fitting, a two key window for improved stability and um, a non-uniformity correction uh, that, you know, if you have a lot of uh, light fall off and you haven't flat fielded your image, that non-uniformity can uh, can affect your your accuracy depending on what the whether you go from light to dark or dark to light. So that correction is important if you if you haven't flat fielded your image. Uh, and then we have some other enhancements. We have the um, um, we now have eighteen color patches here, so just as many as uh, the Calibrite color checker. Uh, we've add, added these logarithmic wedges, which you know have kind of a better range of frequencies than the older hyperbolic ones. And uh, this is our the new standard for resolution measurement. Uh, we have added um, additional linearization options. Uh, we can linearize using the optical electronic conversion function or OECF measured from the grayscale step chart patches. Uh, before we were kind of just, we were estimating the gamma on this. But now we have some, uh, we can use lookup tables. And so, you know, if you have some unusual tonal response, like maybe you have a companded sensor or um, some sort of um, nonlinearity, um, this can improve the accuracy of your measurements in those conditions. Um, we've improved our dynamic range measurement uh, to produce results similar to the P2020, IEEE P2020 draft. Uh, noise standard. Uh, we uh, have we can support a sensor dynamic range calculation using multiple image uh, multi exposure uh, from HDR sensor. So this is you know the kind of signal to noise ratio you might expect from one of these multi multi exposure combinations. So you know you have a you have a, a long exposure for your dark area of the image, medium exposure for the medium area. And a bright exposure for the bright area, and so um, our older metrics or our older calculations would, would struggle with this sort of sawtooth thing, and we've improved those, so it works better now. Um, we've added the uh, for as far as stray light. I mean, stray light came out in 2022, um, but we're continuing to enhance that. We've added support for the IEEE P2020 pre-release flare attenuation calculation. Uh, and the the next version of the light source that we're producing is going to work um, work better for the flare attenuation uh, metric, 
Um, there's also a normalized straight light metric that we recommend for use with our current MTS uh, straight light LED source. And uh, now I'm going to uh, invite JP to talk some about our test lab services that we are offering. Sure, thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is JP Wessenskill. I'm the test uh, test lab services manager uh, here at Emma Test. Um, it's a relatively new service for us. And so if you're not familiar with it, this should be a nice kind of uh, overhead of, of why we decided to provide test lab services and what services we could provide for you. Um, so we do customizable test plans. Um, you'll work closely with uh, probably myself or one of our image science engineers um, to create a test plan that will sufficiently uh, provide provide the results that you need uh, depending on the testing that you need done. Obviously, devices are all very different, you know, endoscope, you know, and this endoscope requires much different testing than, you know, something for machine vision or, you know, traditional photography. And so you get to work with us and we'll we'll help you decide um, if, if you're not sure on, on what metrics we can actually test for you and how, how to go about that. Um, we use, we use, obviously we use our own equipment and our own software. And so if you are, um, currently a customer of ours and you're using our software, uh, the results should be something that you, you obviously recognize and is, is, um, familiar to you. So some of, some of the things that, um, uh, some of some of the things that our customers have have asked us for um, is uh, to provide testing for marketing. And so what we were doing is we were comparing their devices um, to some of their competitors. And so you get a very um, objective point of view as to which one has a higher quality. Um, we've had customers that have uh, they want us to test basically a golden sample for them. And so they found a. a, a one of their best devices through their own testing and then they sent us that device and uh for benchmarking purposes and so then they have you know kind of a a, a set quality that they're that they're trying to strive for um also test validation um so customers that wanted to they were performing their own testing and they had some questions about the procedures and the results and so they sent us one of their devices and so they could compare our results to theirs and that was very helpful for them um, production tolerances, you know, um, customers will send us uh, 10, 15, 20, 30 devices, and we will basically kind of create um, a, a list of tolerances for those uh, sort of pass fail metrics for their for their devices. Um, also, uh, one other one other thing that was very helpful is um, ISP tuning iterations, um, comparing, you know, before and after um, in, in different iterations to see if they were moving around along the right path. And then obviously um, standards validations. Um, there's some standards that, that require third-party validations. Um, we are very familiar with those metrics as we, we commonly sit on standards committees. And so um, providing testing for those is another thing that we do. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. Um, here's just a few of the test lab service metrics um, that the, the uh, we test for. Obviously, we test for everything that Henry described previously in this webinar, um, but MTF, dynamic range, color accuracy, noise metrics, motion blur, stray light, and, and obviously many, many more. So, you know, essentially, if it's in our software, then we'll probably provide it as a service for test lab services. Uh, next slide. Uh, we've broken down our services into different tiers. Um, you know, some are customizable, some are just basically predefined, and then some are fully customizable. Um, each one has, uh, each tier has a different set of, of customizability. And obviously the, the service is provided with each. Um, and, and you know, um, even, even though some of them say that they may not be customizable, we will obviously work with, with anyone to suit your, your testing needs. And then my last slide is uh, the test lab service reports. Um, there's a link at the bottom. Um, I would encourage anyone that is interested to download one of these reports. Uh, they are very comprehensive. And this is, um, we put them on the website and made them available for download um, so that you can get a really good idea of, of what kind of report you'll get from our testing. 
Um, like I said, they're, they're, they're very comprehensive. Um, and we, we provide interpretations of the results along with the results um, and can even provide recommendations if that is something that you are after. Um, you know, uh, they vary. The reports that we've delivered have varied between 10 pages to 80 plus, 100 plus pages, depending on depending on on the testing that we're providing for our customers. Um, so that is that is my last slide. Um, I will I'll hang out here, um, and if anyone has any questions, I I would encourage you to ask, and and we'll go from there. Thank you, JP, and uh, thank you all uh, for attending. And uh, feel free to get in touch with us, and uh, we appreciate your business, and hope we can help make your testing uh, job simpler. Take care. Uh,